All right, so we left off last video talking about finishing up denitrification, where we had this nitrate um, that is being reduced back to N2 gas. We talked about some of the different um, soil conditions uh, that are needed in order to um, expedite this process. Some of the um, bacteria uh, that are responsible for that. And then also uh, the importance of this is that if for some reason that um, this system becomes aerobic, uh, if we get this introduction of oxygen, uh, that we can have this release of this N2O gas, which is 300 times greater warming potential than carbon dioxide. Well, we talked about um, how soil pH and temperature influence that and also uh, when we can expect to see this. And I specifically think I left off with this uh, table explaining all the different reactions and how um, those processes are carried out. Um, another table kind of giving you some information about um, the estimates and um, some recommended adjustments for tillage um, in order to kind of increase the uh, oxygen in the soil. Well, we don't want to have um, compacted uh, anaerobic systems. But moving into ammonia volatilization, um, there are some soil conditions that we need also as well. Uh, and we need that soil pH is typically is going to be above 7.5. And the reason, so, so what happens when the pH goes up? What happens to the hydrogen concentration when the pH goes up? Hydrogen concentration goes down. If hydrogen concentration goes down, what happens to the hydroxyl concentration? It goes up. And so um, these conditions are prime for ammonium NH4 plus to uh, dissociate a hydrogen from that molecule to meet that equilibrium for uh, that high hydroxyl concentration. And so we'll have um, uh, the production of ammonia gas. So our buffering capacity would be a low buffering capacity is going to equal high volatilization because it cannot uh, buffer against those changes. There's not enough CEC to hold that um, ammonium to the soil colloid. Also, uh, increasing temperature is going to uh, expedite this process much quicker. Um, also, as well, the urease enzyme, when we're talking about urea hydrolysis, um, is going to expedite that much quicker too. So we have enzymes and we have moisture content, pH, uh, residue, microbes are, uh, microbes are playing a role in there. Our crop residues, while we want to keep our crop residues on there to um, minimize our runoff and actually preserve some of the soil moisture that we have, uh, they can create some wet human conditions which are going to um, ex exacerbate or speed up, catalyze that um, urea hydrolysis reaction. And so the faster that that reaction happens, the quicker that this volatilization happens um, and your nitrogen and your fertilizer is now lost to the atmosphere, uh, which is not a good thing. Fertilizer is expensive. Uh, and we don't need to be losing it to the atmosphere because we're trying to preserve our environment. Um, nitrogen source, this is why it's important to understand what source you're putting out there and some of those conditions so that we can maximize that. This goes back to this 4R nutrient stewardship. This is our source um, and placement uh, and a little bit of the time as well. Uh, but our urea-based fertilizers and our manures are going to have this ammonia volatilization. They're more susceptible or prone to ammonia volatilization. Um, just the way that the uh, urea molecule undergoes that hydrolysis and the more of it that you have, um, the greater hydrolysis that you'll have. And then also placement. And so I guess around here, uh, most of us would apply urea uh, as a broadcast application for uh, hay situation, 
Um, in row crops, uh, we prefer to have that subsurface banded. Uh, maybe not so much the granular, but if we were using liquid, uh, liquid UN, urea, ammonium, nitrate, uh, we would want to uh, place that underneath the surface and kind of give it an extra layer of protection. But our broadcast applications are going to uh, suffer the most from this. They're the most susceptible. Um, and some of you may know that uh, if, if you put a second application of urea on um, during the summertime, uh, you might get it with agrotain. And agrotain is a uh, urease inhibitor that minimizes this uh, urease enzyme, that activity, and kind of holds that nitrogen, uh, slows down that process, and allows um, an opportunity for that process to go a little bit slower and possibly be incorporated into the soil because of those high temperatures. Um, it's important to kind of know when these things are going to happen. And so if you know um, a little bit about your soil, um, you can kind of minimize some of these risks. So high soil pH, seven, 7.5. Uh, if you had just a little bit of moisture, we're going to have that hydrolysis occur. Uh, we have a low CEC. Our soil surface is gonna have some uh, residue. So in our no-till systems, uh, this is gonna be a big deal. A little bit in pasture, you might have some extra um, hay that just didn't quite get baled. There's a little bit of residue that is still out there. Our nitrogen source, any of our urea containing I mean, um, urea or ammonium containing fertilizers and with a broadcast application. So to low risk, you would want to have um, a, a more acidic soil, dry conditions, but we would want to try and get some rain applied right after our fertilizer application. That's one of the main reasons why we want it to rain is to get that fertilizer moved from the top of the soil surface and infiltrate that into the system. Uh, if you have a high CEC, um, you're less likely to suffer from this because that ammonium is being held by the soil colloids. Uh, for our uh, end source, uh, um, we used to have ammonium nitrate is what we used to use, but now we need to use urea or UN plus this NBPT inhibitor, and that's something that we'll discuss more in person in class. Um, and with that, we also like to incorporate or subsurface apply that um, fertilizer. So some of the significance um, in the lab, um, under the ideal conditions, this is actually being, we're actually trying to maximize ammonia volatilization. Uh, we can have up to 70% loss. Um, some other articles have, or research has shown that you can have 30 or 50% loss, 50% with ammonium sulfate, 30% with urea. Now I want y'all um, to think about those, like those are two of, the, two of the fertilizers that we have been using a lot for, um, for our uh, blend calculations, because these are the ones that you're likely to use the most of or to be able to have the easiest access to. So, um, instead of applying more fertilizer, we first we need to try to uh, utilize that right source, right rate, right place, right time. Uh, and then also some of our uh, other inhibitors, which we'll explain later. <coughs> so moving into kind of how fertilizer is uh, manufactured or created, uh, we had this Haber-Bosch process. Uh, this is why fertilizer is so expensive. So we had this Haber-Bosch process. We have uh, dinitrogen gas, which we fixed from the atmosphere. And then we also have um, hydrogen from natural gas. So like methane, um, other natural gases uh, under the pressure and temperature and this iron catalyst. Uh, we're able to combine those two and form ammonia. Those ammonia gases are cooled and the ammonia turns to liquid and we, are, we can store that or we can combine that with other chemicals in order to form our actual fertilizer.
So once we have the Haber-Bosch process here, we have our uh, liquid ammonia, uh, we can uh, react that with um, sulfuric acid, and that sulfuric acid is going to form ammonium sulfate. So typically we're going to be uh, um, ammonia being a base or, or basic like ammonium hydroxide. Uh, ammonia, we're going to react it with some acid or some acidic source that is going to give us a more stable compound that we can then uh, uh, add to a fertilizer pellet that can be released into the soil. Next will be uh, if we take ammonia and react it with nitric acid we will form ammonium nitrate. Again, this is not readily available um, to the common producer. If you have a research license, um, you, you can still get some, but it's very difficult to, it's very difficult to uh, procure. Next, we're gonna mix um, ammonia with I'll go ahead and add this extra one. All right, so um, let's say we mix ammonia with carbon dioxide. We have this carbon dioxide gas and we create urea. So carbon, CO, NH2, and there are two of those molecules, two of those NH2 molecules. So we would react ammonia with urea and ammonium nitrate and water to make it a liquid solution. It's kind of a um, thick solution. And we would get UN as a 28, 28 or possibly a 32 maybe 30 double um, They're making this UN, this 28 double O with um, about 5% sulfur because we need to add that back to our croplands because we're um, removing that greater than we can replace it. So <coughs> they still do make ammonium nitrate. Uh, it's just you cannot buy it very readily. But we're going to react that with urea to form urea ammonium nitrate. So we call it UAN. And then finally something um, that we've been familiar with is this uh, these ammonium phosphates, so uh, diammonium phosphate, diammonium, there's two ammoniums, diammonium phosphate, and there is monoammonium phosphate. Only one nitrogen in that, I mean one ammonium in that chemical formula, and that is when we mix that with phosphoric acid. So this is kind of straightforward. Um, Sulfuric acid forms ammonium sulfate. Phosphoric acid forms ammonium phosphate. Uh, nitric acid, ammonium nitrate. And then we have our urea and UAN solutions. These two um, in row crop are probably going to be the two that you use the most. I know when I talk to um, some of the students who um, operate hay fields, um, DAP is a common fertilizer because we're trying to get the phosphorus out there. Um, and we get a little bit of nitrogen from that. All right, so just to look at kind of the uh, end sources that we're using, primarily we're using urea. It has a high nitrogen content. Um, this is, uh, this allows us to apply less fertilizer, uh, spend less time in the field, uh, less wear and tear on the machines, etc. cetera. Um, we do have some ammonium sulfate um, typically where I see this at is going to be on golf courses. Um, it's water soluble. Uh, you can mix ammonium sulfate with that and then you can also mix like glyphosate or some other herbicides or um, chemicals and that, that solution mixes really well. Uh, ammonium nitrate, again, very, very difficult to get. And then we have some others that are in there as well. Um, this graph is just kind of showing you that UN is our most uh, becoming the most common or most popular uh, end source. And so that has changed since the 1960s. 
where we used to use more granular. We have come a long way with technology, being able to produce these uh, fertilizer sources much cheaper or at least um, uh, much, much more efficiently. Um, so we're able to use those at a greater rate. All right, so urea, excuse me, about 21% of the uh, nitrogen use in the United States is urea. Again, because it's easy to travel with, um, it's not explosive, uh, it's less corrosive. Uh, we can save a lot of money by switching to GEICO. Uh, we can save a lot of money um, in our storage and our transportation and finally our application. We can put a lot of it in the back of a cone spreader and we can cover a lot of area in a very short period of time and fertilize our fields much quicker. Um, less time in the field means um, more time back at the office at home. Uh, let, that, let that fertilizer do its thing while it's out there. Uh, next we have our nitrogen solutions. This is going to be our liquid UN. Um, about 44% of the nitrogen use is through UN and the reason that we do this, uh, we can apply that as a banded application, um, which puts that nitrogen right where it needs to be, not out in the, not kind of in the furrow where the plant roots aren't really. Um, we can cover those slits up, we can minimize the volatilization and we can improve our nitrogen use efficiency. Uh, we can also apply some pesticides with this uh, because it is liquid. Uh, we can also apply this through fertigation and we can add other liquid fertilizers to this solution uh, and improve our application efficiency. Uh, anhydrous ammonia, uh, I mentioned this before, um, they use this more in our colder weather environments, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, North Dakota, South Dakota, maybe Minnesota. Um, it's applied as a gas. That gas, it is applied um, after the growing season. So right now in Minnesota, it's starting to get cold and they are out applying uh, this anhydrous ammonia. It will stay in the soil as a gas if we cover that slit up. So we wanna make sure that we're covering the slit. Um, it will stay as a gas. And then once the soil temperatures warm up, then it will start on um, start to undergo the process of the transformation from ammonia to ammonium. Uh, some of the ways that we can increase that retention, uh, making sure that we have the right soil moisture, um, make sure we have enough clay content so that's going to go that's going to speak to our CEC, our buffering capacity. Uh, how much we inject, how deep we inject that, and then also how much soil organic matter is there. Because uh, if you remember back from the nitrogen cycle, if we have more organic matter, um, then some of this nitrogen will be immobilized until that carbon is broken down. So we can kind of take advantage of that nitrogen cycle, understanding that, and we can actually manipulate that to our advantage and keep that gas uh, closer to the proximity of the field, not lose it to the environment. Um, ammonium nitrate discontinued. Um, some of y'all may or may not know back in 1995, um, the Edward Murrow building in Oklahoma City was blown up with ammonium nitrate and diesel fuel. Um, it was about that time that they began to really crack down on that. Uh, we also have ammonium sulfate, about 5% of the use. Like I said, I see this used on golf, course, golf courses mostly. Um, but something that is coming up uh, that you are going to start seeing more use of is this urea ammonium sulfate. And so uh, remember they take uh, urea and they add it with ammonium sulfate, one for one, and they come up with this 3300-12S. So you can get two um, urea-based 
fertilizers with sulfur. We have uh, 28005S, which is liquid UN, urea ammonium nitrate plus sulfur, or you can get this granular urea ammonium sulfate. And then our ammonium phosphates, uh, monoammonium phosphate MAP, and diammonium phosphate DAP. Uh, some other ones that you might use, uh, these are likely to be more used in a nursery setting. Uh, sodium nitrate, we have calcium ammonium nitrate products. Um, just some form of uh, either straight calcium nitrate, we have calcium carbonate plus ammonium nitrate. Uh, potassium nitrate, we have actually used potassium nitrate in our Fertilizer calculations, um, this is less acid forming, uh, less explosive, and we can also use this to amend our soil pH. Um, if I'm not mistaken, we use this for stump grinding as well, for um, as a stump remover. So just to be aware, some of the different um, fertilizer sources, kind of what their percentages are, uh, now that you know enough about how to use them, uh, you can begin to uh, price shop and see if those sources will fit your budget or your production system a little bit better. Um, something that we're being pushed, um, we're not being pushed, uh, it's being promoted. Um, we're going to be controlled or slow release fertilizers. Um, we have several different brands of those. Uh, each one is trying, to, each company is trying to come up with their own uh, niche or their own product that is going to kind of uh, minimize our losses to the environment by slowly releasing this fertilizer into the soil. Uh, we have a couple of organic um, solu um, low solubility compounds, uh, urea formaldehyde, isobutylidine, diurea. Uh, you're not likely to deal with these. Um, it, I, I've yet to uh, run across anything where this is something that we use a lot of. However, they do exist um, in our organic systems. These are something that you could use in order to, um, uh, for slow release fertilizers in those systems. Now, we tend to consider urea um, a synthetic fertilizer when we think about that we're actually creating this the way that we go about creating it but um, one of the components or the designations for being organic is that you have carbon and there is carbon in urea so you might be able to um, get by with that on a technicality and so what these have is they had this physical bearer barrier that actually controls the uh, release um, with these inorganic low solubility compounds and that can be uh, this physical barrier can be um, releasing those nutrients primarily the urea uh, based on some weathering process or it might be temperature that kind of opens those pores and allows the release of that fertilizer. Uh, we also have uh, the sulfur coated urea and so the sulfur is going to add that um, once this sulfur kind of uh, decomposes this this sulfur layer decomposes i'm sorry we have this conditioner that is going to kind of keep this in for a moment this is like the first line of defense um, this polymer sealant and then we'll have once this polymer sealant begins to degrade we will have a release of sulfur, which will then start to release some of that urea. On the right, we have a polymer coated urea. So something like um, environmentally smart nitrogen. Um, we will apply this to the soil. Uh, this water will diffuse into the granule. Um, that granule will then dissolve the urea that is inside and then allow that to diffuse back out into the soil and it will undergo the urea hydrolysis process um, once once it is released and maybe even a little bit while we're 
inside the granule. But it releases it slow enough that uh, it can kind of buffer against uh, either too much um, urea entering the soil or maybe there's a, a rain event or uh, some irrigation. And once that happens and we know that we're going to have some infiltration into our soil, then we will get a greater release. So it's just kind of a, a, a controlled release, obviously, or slow extended release uh, that is going to minimize our losses to ammonia volatilization. And also, this is going to allow us to apply a single application of fertilizer. Um, when I think about uh, applying fertilizer, my brain automatically goes to corn. Um, and so, uh, within 28 days, you'll have about 75% of that uh, nitrogen, which is released. This is also going to release that in um, slightly above what is our uh, what our plants are going to uh, take that up, and each plant has a different in uptake, um, an in uptake rate, so to speak. Um, and if we can apply our fertilizer one time and not have to apply it as, um, as a side dress, uh, we can save a lot of time and money, and we're not driving over the field. So uh, these do have a place. And then we have our urease and nitrification inhibitors. And so uh, two of the primary ones that we use are going to be NBP, that, at least that I'm familiar with. Uh, so here we have um, some nitrification inhibitors, nitropyrin and DCD. Um, I'm familiar with these two the most. Um, we have this NBPT. Um, it is sold as agartane. It's like a green liquid. Uh, you can have your urea uh, coated with this prior to application, and it minimizes uh, that urease activity. Um, Super U is also a, this is an enhanced efficiency fertilizer. So it has both a um, DCD plus NBPT. And so down here, um, our combination products, at least these two are going to be our um, enhanced efficiency fertilizers. We have DCD and NBPT, which can be mixed with liquid UN sold as Agritain Plus. Uh, here we have um, U-Max or U-Flex and Super U. It just depends on um, who's selling it. Each company is wanting their own uh, product that they can sell to producers, but those inhibitors are typically going to minimize volatilization and nitrification and a little bit of denitrification. And then finally, our organic sources. Uh, we've been using organic sources like the animal manures um, since kind of the beginning of, of farming. Uh, they actually make up about 40% of the total nitrogen consumption uh, or usage in the United States. And we are producing 1 billion tons, a billion tons of organic nitrogen sources used as fertilizer uh, through ag operations, uh, municipalities, and other industrial wastes, um, other industrial wastes, uh, they generate 1 billion tons of this material. And if you remember back that we are actually producing 139 million tons, um, we are actually manufacturing 139, excuse me, million tons of synthetic fertilizer. So for our sources, uh, we'll have them come from either animals or plants. Uh, for animals, we'll have a high nitrogen content and our plant-based organic sources are going to have a low nitrogen content. So you'll need more of those uh, in order to meet your in rate or you will have to apply those over a um, extended period of time. You may have to um, apply multiple applications of this plant based organic source. <coughs> so we had this organic base uh, with a low uh, nitrogen or in mineralization potential. So that'll be available for those microbes 
in order to uh, decompose some of those carbon materials. Like I can remember my grandfather would rake up all the leaves in the yard and he put them in the garden and then he would buy a pile of horse manure and he would spread the horse manure over the leaves um, and that would decompose those leaves a, little, um, a lot faster and release that nitrogen into the soil. So it's kind of a balance. He kind of knew how to go back and forth with that in order to uh, make that system work. Uh, we have short-term nutrient supply, uh, relatively high nitrogen content, uh, and that is going to be uh, readily mineral uh, mineralized in our manures and biosolids. Uh, we call this um, uh, bovine biosolid byproduct. So some other byproducts of those plant animal or plant processing facilities can be used um, as, a, as a secondary uh, cash source. Sewages and sludges have been making a uh, presence in the market, especially in golf courses. Uh, so we can increase that organic matter content without changing the structure or uh, the water infiltration capacity of our soils. Uh, because those are mostly sand-based soils. Um, and so, you know, these sewages and sludges are um, treated, especially the human waste, because we don't want to be applying human feces and human waste matter. Um, so they undergo a, um, a kind of a decontamination process to make sure that any of those harmful uh, bacteria or microbes or anything that is in there um, is uh, minimized, neutralized, and we can then apply those in a safe manner. And then we have our biosolids uh, where we're 10 million tons per year and that is processed prior to applying that on the land. So for our manure sources, uh, we're producing about 150 million tons per year. Um, about half of that, a little less than half of that is coming from our confined animal feeding operations because we have to have something to do um, with all of that waste. So what we're trying to do is figure out ways to apply that. Um, let's also think about poultry litter. Um, for those who have poultry houses, we like to apply that on our fields uh, and get some benefit from that from that waste. Um, however, one problem with applying those manures is that they are easily, uh, uh, they can be lost to runoff. Um, also that they have, uh, we're applying those at, at high volumes. So, you know, a poultry application might be two or three tons to the acre. So you're talking 6,000 pounds but it's also 3% and you're applying about 180 pounds of phosphorus per acre, which is not good. So uh, just to kind of have an idea about when you are applying those, what other um, kind of implications are there. And then some of our um, other plant sources, uh, we can see that our animal base have high nitrogen content, some 9 to 13, uh, 8 to 16 fat guano. Uh, this was actually, um, believe it or not, there was a war fought over um, the, the guano from um, uh, birds and bats on an island somewhere in South America. Um, they were really fighting over the, uh, who owned the rights to that and who was going to get that island because there was so much guano being produced that... Um, there was actually, they were going to make a lot of money from that. Uh, we have plant-based, which is going to be like a brewer's grain or distiller's pulp. Uh, we'll have some yard waste, so our leaves and our compost, and then uh, municipal sewage from our biosolids is about 1% to 6%. Uh, but we have to get rid of these somewhere. Like uh, We don't want to just throw them in a landfill or just kind of a big pile uh, because they will undergo some ammonia volatilization, and that volatilization back into the atmosphere is not good for our environment. So we're trying to maximize and utilize these 
um, alternative sources uh, just because we need to be more efficient with the materials that we're using. All right, so that's all I got for this portion. Um, I will be back to y'all on next Thursday, the Thursday after spring break, and we will start to go into the actual chemistry and the breakdown um, from when we apply urea, undergo urea hydrolysis, uh, talk about the transformations from ammonium to nitrate, and then back through denitrification. All right, y'all have a good spring, I mean fall break.